Broadcasting from the far side of Enceladus, beaming in at the speed of light across the vast chasms of space, streaming directly into your brain. You're listening to the Spartacast League. I am Phelan, and joining us today, it's just Eno. Our usual co-host, Attica, couldn't make it in due to scheduling. Our first story, just diving into it here, it's a follow-up from last episode. Reports have come in through documents and drawings leaked to the press of torture at POW camps in Yemen ran by the United Arab Emirates. And some of the stuff is really, really horrific. Yeah, evidently, uh, a lot of these drawings and letters that were smuggled out of prison by these uh, hemp detainees were on paper plates, which is amusing in a rather distressing way. I don't think I'll be able to look at a paper plate comfortably for a while. Some of these descriptions, just reading about them, some of these descriptions of these depictions are uh, really unsettling. They include showing a man hanging naked from chains while being electrocuted, prisoner surrounded by barking dogs being kicked while on the floor, and uh, a really distressing amount of uh, just sodomy. And reading this, I'm I'm getting, uh, I'm feeling Fifty Shades of Abu Ghraib here. That was the first thing that came to mind was the Abu Ghraib prison situation. It should be no surprise that there are reports that United States military staffers had been seen at this prison reportedly. But also, no surprise, the recent CIA pick, which probably has their hand in this particular incident, Gina Haspel, she oversaw the the prison facilities in Thailand during the Iraq war where they sent people in to be detained and to get confessions out of people using so-called enhanced interrogation, which often included methods such as these. It should be no surprise that we see that this is being repeated here. In this particular case, there doesn't seem to be any conclusion as to whether the Americans that were allegedly seen on site by these detainees were private sector or were on the payroll of the United States government. But from my understanding of how our proxy wars and uh, black book operations are conducted, I don't think that matters very much. Private sector or actually having paychecks from the CIA, it doesn't really matter. We, we've got our fingers in a lot of pies across the country, across the world rather. I wanted to actually read a quote from one of the people that was detained there. And he said, they tortured me without even accusing me of anything. Sometimes I wish that they would give me a charge so that I can confess and end this pain. The worst thing about it is that I wish for death every day and cannot find it. That's what these people are going through every day at this prison, which who knows how many American dollars are going to fund this kind of stuff. We could never really know if uh, our tax money is going here because like in an earlier episode, we showed that $700 billion just disappears from the Pentagon and you have to wonder where that stuff goes. It's all black book slush funds. Speaking of the the products, the historical products of United States uh, black book slush funds, We know scientifically at this point, there have been studies conducted, we know that interrogation, be it the old school type stuff, just inducing pain or sleep deprivation or enhanced interrogation techniques, sodomy and the like, we know that they don't actually yield actionable information. That's not the purpose of this. The CIA knows this. Every other country that engages in this knows this. The only people that don't know this are the mobsters on television. These techniques are not used to try and pry information out of detainees. These techniques are explicitly used to demoralize, to threaten, and in the case of this particular detainee from whom we heard that quote, in these such cases, they're used to try and push a false confession out of somebody to try and get them to give up and comply to whatever dark machinations the organization conducting the torture has in mind. The other reason that this kind of thing is being used is because of the culture there, because being raped in an Arab culture is often seen as something shameful. This is being used as a deterrent to keep people from fighting. This is basically psychological warfare. They're basically saying, well, if you decide to fight and we capture you, this is what we're going to do to you and you're going to go to hell because of it. 
And that is a popular, unfortunately, interpretation of the Islamic religion in that particular re region. And they're betting on it being used as a deterrent. And unfortunately, that's not the only thing we have to say on a deeply unethical detainment tonight. I wanted to first go into, on the immigration issue, the due process behind it before we tackle the the actual detainment and some of the things that we've discovered hidden in the news here. Trump went to Twitter and his two o'clock in the morning tweets basically said, we cannot allow these people to invade our country. When somebody comes in, we must immediately, with no judges or court cases, bring them back from where they came. Our system is a mockery of good immigration policy and law and order. Most children come without parents. This is his quote from Twitter that I'm reading you. It's something that, you, that I will be dropping into the show notes so everybody can see. The disturbing thing about this is this interpretation that he is using here, that you could be accused of something, a, a crime, Ill, illegal immigration, basically, entering the country illegally. And because of the particular crime that you're being accused of, they don't have to go through the courts. You don't have to see a judge. They could just deport or detain you based off of that. That's really disturbing because that is a violation of due process. In the United States, you have a constitutional right to face your accuser, even if your accuser is the government. And the reason that we have that right is because otherwise the government could accuse you of anything, anything at all, and place you in jail for it and not give you trial. It is a violation of the 5th, 6th, and 14th Amendments. This is three amendments here that we are violating. Amusingly enough, in this tweet, he did get something absolutely right. Our system is a mockery of good immigration policy and law and order. It's worth noting that this tweet is absolutely in holding with how he's spoken in the past on Fox and Friends when he advocated for the use of torture overseas on prisoners of war, that being a war crime and all. Shoot, just a plethora of other cases where he seems to have a fundamental misunderstanding of the human rights afforded to people who are suspected of crimes. Well, this guy... The president and his supporters don't care about fundamental human rights. They are authoritarians to the core, regardless of what they claim. They believe in what is basically legalism, which it's actually the very first form of fascism. If, if you want to take that back in history, uh, legalism actually comes from a doctrine that came out of uh, China to unify China under the Qin Dynasty. And under the Qin Dynasty, the emperor imposed this system and it was really, looking back at it, very comparable to Nazi Germany. One of the things that he, that uh, the emperor did at the time actually was is he had records burned of history. He had all works of fiction that he could he could find burned. The other thing that he did is he took academians and he dug a huge grave and he dumped them in there and he lit it on fire and then buried them. And we see this kind of attitude still today towards towards academia, towards his critics, towards any group that Donald Trump doesn't like or the alt-right doesn't like, they dehumanize them so that they don't have to give them due process. And so as to effectively undercut their role as public speakers and community leaders. It's really easy to deprive a large group of people of a voice if you take the smartest person the, the most well-read and well-educated person, the person with the historical context to understand why and how these problems are arising, and you discredit them publicly. Because of everything else that's happening around this, if you could just be detained without a court case or deported without a court case, that pretty much means that Donald Trump has power to remove anybody in the country through ICE and that ICE just now becomes the Gestapo to stuff the camps in full of people that maybe your neighbor doesn't like you because he's a MAGA hat and 
well, maybe he thinks you're an illegal immigrant, but he can't prove it. If he's buddies with the ICE agent, nobody's going to know. And that's not even the most ridiculous thing on here. Uh, in addition to, to all this, they're making children, some as young as three years old, represent them in court. And one of the immigration judges, Jack Well, apparently has been briefing toddlers on immigration law to defend themselves in court. Three, four, five-year-old kids so that they could defend themselves without a lawyer in his and other judges' courts. Which is confusing. This is either a conscious decision on their part to do something incontestably evil, or this is a fundamental disconnect of logic so deep that you've got to wonder how they got into these positions of power. I mean, any of you out there who have kids or hang around with kids or in involve yourself with kids at all, you can't effectively brief a five-year-old on how not to eat a Lego. It's very clear because like there are articles out there that demonstrate that the kids obviously can't defend themselves. They're distracted. They're you're looking at their untied shoe trying to tie it while the judge is speaking to them. They're sucking on their thumb or, or whatever. There were a couple of high profile stories, uh, mostly in the form of tweets by a particular public defender who was talking about how her five-year-old client was very excited to press the elevator buttons after she had just tried to impress upon her five-year-old client the gravity of the situation she was in. Before that, there was a story of a court proceeding having to be completely halted because the four-year-old child was attempting to climb up onto the table. These kids barely know where they are. A lot of them don't have a great grasp of English. Imagine that. None of them have the logical faculties to realize, not, not the logical faculties, but the understanding of the situation they're in, to realize how deeply this is going to affect the rest of their life and how egregiously the system is stacked against them. This is, this is a level of absurdity in our policy and our, our legal proceedings right now that Kurt Vonnegut wouldn't write about. It is absolutely insane to think that children can represent themselves in court. They play these games. This is why they're separating out the kids from the parents and making the kids defend themselves. They're playing games with them, legal games, and the children don't understand this. So one of the things that they're doing, and a quote from the Washington Post here is, but the questions can easily trip up children with no lawyers, the attorney said. A judge may ask, for example, if the child wants to leave the country voluntarily or would they rather be ordered deported. If the child chooses either option, he or she cannot apply for other forms of immigration relief, such as asylum in the United States. They are literally duping kids into legally contractual obligations here or confessions so that they can get rid of them or detain them. And it's sick. It's easy though, like taking asylum from a baby. That's literally what it is though. Like you joke, but that's exactly what it is. They are using color of law to play these games with children, which they have no faculty for understanding the depth of the situation and they're taking advantage of it. You always like to hear like people on the right screaming about politicizing children and stuff. This right here is the ultimate politicization of children in the worst manner possible. And we're treating people who are coming to this country because they want a better life, because they want to escape from gang violence that the American government through the CIA caused in Guatemala. They want to come to the United States to avoid that. And this is what they're being treated with. With They're having their children taken away from them. Their children are, are put into separate court cases and then ask questions like this so that they could deport the kid. And who knows if they're going to be reunited with the parent at that point. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's not like if the kid confesses to crossing the border illegally, they're going to grab the parents, grab the kid, put them on a bus back to Mexico. That's not what's going to happen here. I, I, I'm not fully aware of how the process is going to go, but there is absolutely no ordinance for reunifying families if the, ch <laughs> the child 
states in a court of law that they broke the law and they're okay with being deported. I don't even know if this is technically even legal at this point. In order to actually have a legal confession or a legal decision, the person has to have the the mental capacity to make said decision. I would assume that there is multiple court cases on this. I, I can't point out any by, any by hand. I would imagine that something is deeply wrong here and that this is a violation of the law. And the fact that and, and the fact that this has been happening since 2014, this is not a Trump thing. And we need to get this out of our minds. We need to stop blaming Donald Trump purely for this when the exact same thing was going on under Obama. July to December of 2014, 42% of 20,000 cases of children had no defense attorney whatsoever. It is an egregious miscarriage of justice. And what's even more egregious here is that while these children are being detained, some of the experiences that have come out about these children is just absolutely appalling. Shiloh Treatment Center, which was one of the places where these children were being detained, there were multiple reports of children being injected with sedatives and given medications to make them more docile. It's absolutely appalling. In one case, uh, in particular, one child was injected with over 10 drugs. And uh, I'll, I'll admit, my clinical knowledge of a, a lot of these newer psychoactive antipsychotics, therapeutic drugs, my, my clinical knowledge is a little bit lacking, but I have a rather extensive experience having been prescribed many of these when I was younger. The, the list includes Geodon, an antipsychotic that with heavier use, especially in somebody with lower biomass, can cause type 2 diabetes. Clonazepam, which is, it's a benzodiazepine, mostly used for anti-anxiety, but benzodiazepine can trigger psychotic effects and actually really doesn't get along with any known antipsychotic except for lithium. These drugs, what I'm saying, are largely incompatible. It's advised against mixing antipsychotics and benzodiazepines and central nervous system depressants and psychotropics. They were injected with a cocktail of drugs that some of which are incompatible. And that's not even mentioning the fact that these are children. Their brains, their bodies, their endocrine systems are not fully formed and fully developed yet. There is a huge difference between the biochemistry of a child and a young adult. Their bodies have not stabilized quite yet. We don't know exactly how this is going to affect an adult individual. And further, we don't know how this cocktail of drugs will affect a child. It, far be it for me to just cry conspiracy and again fall on the sword that is Godwin's law. It almost makes me think that there this, this is actually experiments. Ex exactly. This it sounds like they are conducting experiments. This is the exact type of stuff that was done in concentration camps in Nazi Germany and other totalitarian regimes to make people within the camps become more docile. That's And that's actually admittedly what they said was the stated purpose in the article for this. And it seems to have worked. I mean, the kids were lethargic. They were out of it. And who could blame them when you're being given those kinds of medications and the amounts that they were given. One of the stories here from somebody is that uh, a lady said that her daughter had fell so many times on her head that she was confined to a wheelchair when she saw her, when she went to pick her up. This is a sick violation of, of human rights of the highest order. I would, I would like to know who prescribed and administered these drugs because just on the surface, it looks like it looks like a very clear-cut case of a violation of the Hippocratic Oath. This is not do-no-harm behavior. I cannot imagine that this would have been done by somebody that's even a registered nurse. I don't even think that this is something that 
I, I don't think that they have a pharmacist at this facility because a pharmacist would have the duty to say, no, you can't give this person these drugs altogether, or you can't even give this drug to this person because they're not displaying that those kind of symptoms. You're right. That would be a violation of the Hippocratic Oath, which physicians, pharmacists, and nurses have to abide by. But do keep in mind, we live in America, the same nation where they can violate the Hippocratic Oath if you don't have enough money. So there is that. And we do know that our law enforcement agencies, particularly immigration and customs enforcement, are known to operate outside of the letter of the law. I really do hope that this story with the kids, I really do hope that it is coming to a close because this was a manufactured crisis for the most part of detaining the kids that has developed over the last two months because of a decision made by Sessions and other people in the Trump administration to enforce a law to their inter particular interpretation. Since then, it does seem like there has been an executive decision made to no longer do this and to reunite the families, but it seems like they've been really slow to act on it. And in the meantime, they are building more camps. So it seems like they're going from separating the parents and children into different camps to just pushing them all into the same camp because the United States military has just green-lighted three facilities for hosting over 25,000 people in Alabama and North Florida, and then another two facilities for 47,000 people in California, near San Francisco and near Camp Pendleton. The description for these camps in the, the Time article is simply austere. I'd like to know more details okay, on so, exactly what constitutes uh, austere. Okay, so austere means that it is Spartan, that it's, it's bare bones. These are minimalist facilities that are being designed for temporary use. That's what they mean by temporary and austere. Well, what I'm asking is by precisely what metric are these simply corners being cut? Well, yeah. Corners are going to be cut, obviously. Amenities are, are not going to be there. And with this being Alabama and Florida, where some of these are being planned to be built, and even Texas, this week, two-thirds of the entire United States is under a severe heat warning. It was 100 degrees in New York. It was 100 degrees in Boston. It was like 102 or something like that in, in Chicago. I mean, I, this weather pattern this year is settling in for a very long time. Admittedly, I listened to Coast to Coast. I love it. They had a, a guy on there that was talking about the uh, potential and weather patterns. And he said that that high pressure system is probably going to rest over the United States for most part of the summer, probably into August or September. If that happens, if, th if that particular weather pattern locks in while they're detaining people in the summer heat in Alabama, where there's 100% humidity and triple digits, this is a recipe for massive, massive death. That exactly is what highlights the gravity of the point I'm trying to make here, the, the, the question I'm trying to ask here, what exactly do they mean by austere? Because when you say austere and you say camps in the same sentence, my first thought is, of course, good old Joe Arpaio's system. That's one sanitary pad per menstrual cycle. That is, that is exactly that is where they got this idea from. People like, walking around. That is two meals a day. That is no air conditioning. That is up to 15% of these people not having shoes for a couple months of their stay. When you say austere and you say camps, we can only look at how Arpaio did it. That is not a pretty picture. Really, you just have to look at Trump's relationship with Arpaio to understand what's going on. Trump was a very big supporter of Arpaio in Arizona. It is no coincidence that this is happening. You know, I never imagined his getting pardoned. After he was pardoned, I never imagined I'd hear about him again. I, I, I figured the guy would fade into obscurity and America would collectively forget the abuses 
that his detainees suffered at his hands. I think that it is time that Arpaio be dragged in front of the Hague at an international court and the situation be dealt with there because America obviously cannot carry out justice anymore, especially under the Trump regime. It's absolutely sickening that this guy who, for all intents and purposes, if those camps would have contained soldiers, this would have been a war crime. This would have been something that you would hear on the news every day about. It just gets shoehorned in like it's a bullet point when he gets pardoned. Like I said, it's, it's absolutely no coincidence that this is happening and no coincidence that Arpaio was pardoned. But the thing that makes all of this even more disturbing is the fact that they're going to be able to put people in these camps without due process, without proper representation in court, the right to face your accuser. They're just going to be able to stuff people in here. And who knows who they're going to stuff in here? Maybe political enemies. We don't know. It's temporary. And apparently austere, whatever, like you said, whatever the heck that means. One thing, though, that did surprise me in all of this, though, there was something good in the news, though, uh, in regards to immigration. Uh, people are putting their foot down. Even Amazon, their employees, actually wrote a letter to the CEO and posted it on their company wiki demanding that Amazon halt operations of the recognition system, the system that we went over last week that allows law enforcement for them to don on some special glasses, peer into a crowd and get instant notifications on who everybody is in that crowd to identify them. And they also wanted to stop work on Palatin, which is the database that ICE uses to keep track of illegal immigrants and gather data on, which of course, I would assume the two things are linked. And one of the reasons given in the letter was that they actually made a comparison of what they were doing at Amazon to how IBM was complacent in their deals with Nazi Germany. Which I think at this point is no longer an unfair comparison to make. People will say, hey, we're, we're breaking, you know, Godwin's law here and everything, which, which we've done several times tonight. But insert your favorite totalitarian regime in there. And this is the kind of stuff that no totalitarian regime of the past has ever had. We all know the inclinations that the FBI, the CIA, the NSA, and other law enforcement agencies have had towards spying on the American people. And we all know how aggressive ICE is. Of course, we've also seen how aggressive, of course, local police are. So it shouldn't be a surprise if this technology is actively used against people in ways that nobody ever thought that it would be used. I mean, we already have a significant problem with racial profiling on the, the ground floor of law enforcement right now that is municipal law enforcement largely just imagine if we have a system that allows one of these law enforcement officers to look at you and see your political leanings and your internet history far be it to imagine that and your social circles spelled out on your face with augmented reality as clearly as they could look at you and see your race yeah, and this is profiling. This is some <laughs> minority report level of scary here. Like, this is the stuff that you read in science fiction and think would never happen. And it's it's being developed right here, apparently. The thing that it makes it particularly dangerous with ICE is that these systems have been shown, and we discussed this last week, is that they are notoriously bad at identifying people of color. They can be pretty bad at identifying white people, but they seem to be a lot more accurate than dealing with people of color. Like the last episode, we had pointed out an instance where in the UK, 95% of people of color 
were false positives. So that means that the system was only 5% effective. Now this wasn't recognition admittedly that was being used here, but the technology is very similar and will need to be trained over a period of time. But in the meantime, you're gonna have people misidentified across the board. And of course, once the accusation's there, bam, you go to the detainment camp and you're not given trial and you have all your rights stripped away. What? Because some software said so. It's almost as if the system, having been largely designed by Caucasians, has some difficulty processing the some, identifying Some programmer bias, if you will. Yeah. Weird. Well, that's the thing about creating AI systems is a lot of times unconscious bias does play a role in that. And you don't find out until it's too late, until you've already deployed the system and the bug reports start swarming in. And when you're talking about employing it for law enforcement, it gets extra dangerous because it's no longer bug reports that are coming in. It's, it's court cases. It's incident reports from field testing. Exactly. It's, it's body bags. Exactly. Incident reports from field testing are very unlike incident reports from lab testing. Incident reports from lab testing are, oh, we made a mistake. We'll learn from it. Incident reports from field testing are, oh, we've ruined a life or shot somebody. Whoops. I don't mean to fixate and I don't mean to be an alarmist, but I would like to very briefly circle back to the point that I was making earlier about an augmented reality system that shows personal metadata directly into the eyes of a law enforcement officer. Look at race relations in the United States, especially as they pertain to law enforcement. Look at all of the dialogue we've got going on. Thank God, bless those SJWs for actually forcing this, this subject out into the open. Look at all of the drama that's going on. Look at the fact that you can't spend one 24-hour news cycle without hearing about how race and law enforcement are being issues right now in the United States. And consider the very root of this is that race is easy to see. If you walk up to somebody and you look at them before you consciously consider anything about them as a person, your brain has already logged their facial features and the color of their skin. Now imagine a world wherein law enforcement personnel could look at you and look at your face and have their augmented reality system bring up if you're a, a political dissident or a sex degenerate or an alcoholic or if you have a criminal history. If they can look at you and easily discern aspects of your personal life as, as easily as they could discern your race or your gender, that says a lot of very bad things about where our future could be headed. That is a genuinely terrifying system. And if that system does get implemented on the scale that it looks like it's going to be implemented on, we're going to have a lot of trouble with it in the future. That's why I wanted to highlight this particular article of these employees standing up and saying no, simply because this has been a trend. Because not only has it happened at Amazon, workers at Microsoft didn't want to uh, maintain the systems for ICE. And workers at Google didn't want to develop basically weapon systems for the Pentagon. So it's all over the place. These, these workers are, are seeing the future coming down the line and realizing they have to live with the consequences of what they're developing. Good on these people because they were successful in getting Amazon to, to stop. And in the case of Google, Google dropped out of its contract with the Pentagon. It's really inspiring to see this level of forward thinking and this level of individual consciousness in, in these workers because we've seen what being complicit in an industry that contributes to a totalitarian state leads to. We've seen that. The engineer, the factory worker says, I just rivet the airframe together. And the truck driver says, I just take the plane parts to the airfield. And the pilot says, I just fly the plane. And the bombardier says, I just press the button. And with the decentralization of the onus of responsibility in these industries, in the military and in large totalitarian governments, 
it always leads to a great deal of suffering and bloodshed. And it's really nice to see these organizations realizing that their work is potentially going to have very, very, very deleterious effects on the future of our entire species and deciding not to have any part in it. This is very, very good news, my friends. Speaking of shutting down ICE, they shut down the ICE office in Portland. There was a major protest. It lasted uh, about a few days before they were able to actually successfully shut down the ICE office. But then, of course, they cleared it out and, of course, operations began again, but under slightly different rules because of the executive action that was written up in response to the protests, actually. The protest, it was Occupy ICE. It started in Portland. It lasted a few days, about, I'd say, yeah, about a week. And ICE announced that they were going to stop operations at the facility. At that point, Trump signed an executive order changing the uh, way that uh, the detainment's handled so that uh, they'll no longer be separating parents from their kids. And then, of course, DHS rolled out security forces which looked like riot police, but they were federal forces in the area and forced to clear out of the uh, protesters. Which, among the reasons for protesters to clear out, there seemed to be a, a startling number of people driving cars into crowds. Have you noticed that? The landlord. Something, something, Mao, something, something, landlords. <laughs> as much as I want to make the joke, I will let the audience do the rest. A landlord that owned the ICE facility, he was leasing it out, took his Mercedes SUV and tried to plow it through a crowd. And he accelerated towards and hit a protester, Juliet Morgans, who thankfully survived. She maintained some injuries, but is okay, is stable. And basically, he was claiming that he was just protecting his property, that he saw them surrounding the building and beating on windows and stuff like that. He got into an argument with some of the people there. He went back to his car and then he plowed right into the crowd. Protecting his property by attempting to drive an SUV into a crowd of nonviolent protesters. The guy, Stuart Lindquist, he's 79 years old. Pretty much you can read all about him online now. Uh, he's pretty web famous now. And he's probably going to go to jail for what he did uh, if uh, if they prosecute him. Because this is clearly a case of assault with a deadly weapon. Possibly attempted murder at this point. So he could be going away for a while. But the interesting thing is, is like, like you said, this isn't the first time that we see somebody get plowed over in a car. And this actually happened at one of the other protests that we're, we're going to be talking about in, in East Pittsburgh. Uh, Antoine Rosé, the kid that got shot, somebody plowed through a, a crowd there at a protest. Thankfully, nobody got killed. But this is a recurring incident among the right where they are using vehicles as weapons now. And we saw this a long time coming because one of the things that we always saw brewing as right-wing talking points is, well, let's just drive through the crowd if there's a protest. Don't block the street. You can't be in the street protesting because cars are supposed to be there. I've heard that line of rhetoric from several conservatives. And even before the United States got all, like, actively protesty, what with the, the Trump administration causing all this drama since their inception. This was a popular talking point for the No Dapple pipeline as well, where uh, there was an incident where some of the uh, Native American protesters blocked a street and somebody, had, had, where there was a lot of comments online that the oil company should just go in with bulldozers and, bull, and basically run them over. Basically Tiananmen Square, but for Native Americans. Well, fortunately these dicks can't have tanks. Getting run over by a car is bad enough. Getting run over by a Chinese MPT is a bit different. Even before all of this rhetoric about, oh, don't block the streets or you'll get hit by a car, maybe. I remember one of the pro-Second Amendment talking points from just in the past 10 years with the inevitable talk of banning this and that kind of gun or putting this kind of regulation down uh, following any mass shooting in the United States. You would always hear this talking point, 
Well, you know, you can kill people with a car, too. Look how dangerous cars are. You're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna ban cars? Huh? You, you, you're, gonna, you're gonna come over here and, and, and try to take my assault rifle? What, you're gonna take my Chevy, too? I could kill people with that. And it was always dismissed as just a silly lapse in logic, but now we're beginning to see vehicles being weaponized pretty commonly in terrorist attacks. And, I mean, to all y'all on the right, congratulations, you played yourself. When do they not play themselves? <laughs> Going back to this, this Occupy ICE here, not only did it happen in Portland, it kicked off protests nationwide. Los Angeles, Detroit, Atlanta, New York, Philadelphia. Philadelphia, Boston. Yeah, exactly. This one incident sparked action across the board. And that's an important thing to note here. That is a very important thing to note here. The first step is always the hardest to take. But when you see something this big and this important going down, it really helps to encourage you to, to engage in something like that on your turf. I think that they actually did it in perhaps the best way possible. Because if you really think about it, denying them access and blocking their ability to actually do the thing is the best way to make sure that they don't do the thing and that they have to shut it down and have to change. And even if they didn't, let's say they just put out DHS forces and they forcefully cleared people out, the resulting public backlash from that would be so great, it's a pyrrhic victory for them to do that. You gain more supporters when you trample over people and force them out. I think that somebody within the government, not Trump, realized this and pumped the brakes on it and got with with the president and said, no, you have to address this because you can't just go in there and push him out because if you don't make concessions, it's going to get way worse with these people and they're not going to go away and you're just going to create a situation for recruitment. I, I think somebody made that estimate and that so this strategy works. Because the government reacting in uh, an overtly hostile and physically violent way is one way to turn a protest into a riot. It's one way to turn a protest into a national movement against the government, too, at which they don't want to do that. The thing that makes us different from Occupy of the Past is Occupy of the Past, back 10 years ago, they didn't actually occupy anything. If you actually go and research what they did, they didn't go out on the trading floor and camp out. They didn't camp out in front of the buildings. They camped out in this park that was adjacent to some, you know, the Wall Street, basically. And it was a quite a large park and everything, but it was it was a little bit out the way. So, well, that kind of direct action is the progenitor to this kind of direct action. That kind of direct action is much softer. It's when you're going in to do your horrible, unethical job, you're going to have to see us. You can't look away from the people you're hurting. Exactly. It's much the same thought pattern as a hunger strike. This kind of direct action is closer to the strikes of old, where they'll get in front of the door and they'll say, you going to push past me to do your job, huh, buddy? You going to get violent? Or are you just going to sit there and wait this out and listen to us this time? This type of direct action is a lot more confrontational, but it is not directly and overtly violent or destructive. It's a very capable kind of direct action. And while I don't think we should sit here and speak ill of the Occupy movement, it wasn't terribly effective because how is a hunger strike going to affect a cadre of sociopaths? It was also because of the location as well. I think if had they had chose a more visible location, had they had done something to disrupt operations rather than just be a visual nuisance, I think they would have gotten a lot further yeah, exactly. Visibility alone won't get the job done. That's what we learned from Occupy. Exactly. So and it's nice to see that we have mm -hmm. learned that. Exactly. And so this is everything that was good about Occupy just revamped and done right. This is this is what they should have done before. I'm glad to see that it's it's coming back and we're not repeating the same mistake, that we're, we're doing it right this time. And I want to see more of that from, from the left. 
Yeah, so speaking of protests here and, and whatnot, and something that should be protested, the deputy prime minister of Italy, Salvini, called for ethnic cleansing in his country. The exact quote was, we need a mass cleansing street by street, piazza by piazza, neighborhood by neighborhood. We need to be tough because there are entire parts of our cities, entire parts of Italy that are out of control. He's looking to Donald Trump as a solution and is, has been inspired by what we've been doing here in the United States, which is really disturbing. Now, what he's talking about here is he wants to institute a census of the Roma community in Italy. It raised some hackles when we all first heard about this census. And there was a bit of talk like, well, you know, it always starts with a census. And you know what? It we're talking about here there's leaked audio after everyone gets a little bit worried over a over an explicit census of romani people in italy there's leaked audio of him calling for a mass cleansing so the the leaked audio wasn't even the shocking part of it it's what he was willing to actually say to a reporter the leaked audio is actually not even as bad as what he he said in a re, to a reporter. He said to a broadcaster for Tele Lombardia, "I've asked the ministry to pair a dossier on the Roma question in Italy." The what now? The Roma what now? Where have we seen this language before? Like this is even going past what we're talking about with Trump. This is full-blown Nazi-type language here. That this is, is explicitly implicit. This is... He is literally using a phrase coined by Himmler. You take this and you look at the phrase, the Jewish question, and there is no question about the origin of this phrase and where he's getting these ideas from. But just looking at what's being said here, like some of the things that he's actually come out and said in regards to the uh, the leaked audio. He also said earlier this week that Roma found to have Italian nationality, unfortunately, should be allowed to stay in the country while others would be expelled. And this is a, a quote from The Independent here summarizing what he had said. So everything that's on record about the situation is just levels upon levels disturbing. And of course, we see this playing out with the Roma who were also a target of the Nazis and other totalitarian regimes within Europe because of their misalignment, because of stereotyping, and simply just because of material conditions which have turned them towards unsavory methods for survival. But hey, as long as our uh, deputy PM Matteo Salvini can keep the Ubers running on time, I guess everything will be fine. So some good news here, though, back here in America. Congratulations to uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who won a primary against a very long-standing congressman, 10-term congressman Joseph Crowley in a landslide election of 57 to 42 percent which is actually a pretty astounding metric that is a huge margin actually uh, most elections in this country are generally pretty close you don't really see shifts of more than a few percentage points especially against incumbents that are established like this well i think that might have had to do with the voter base New York's 14th district, which is nearly 50% Hispanic or Latino, according to the most recent census. But I honestly think that what it mostly had to do was her platform. Exactly. Uh, is anything to say about her platform? Basically, her platform here is the progressive wet dream here. <laughs> so a few of the things on here, abolishing ICE, cancellation of Puerto Rican debt, and a Marshall Plan for recovery, which a lot of people in her district are from Puerto Rico. Medicare for all, housing as a human right, the abolition of the private prison system, and free access to higher education. You know, going down that list, that actually sounds more like a, a party Democrat's wet dream. And that if you so much as whisper more than two of those bullet points while one is sleeping, they will wake up drenched in sweat. 
I would I would consider that a wet dream. I, I have more of those than I do the other type. I will tell you that. We have a genuine socialist who just won a primary for a Senate seat. That is so good. At least a DSA member, which honestly, it's better than nothing. And to those people out there that want to continue and complain about entryism. To, to a lot of the people who are spewing invective about how dangerous and counterproductive entry is in, mean, as it turns out, it can work in our favor. These values, this platform is something that a lot of us have been trying to push establishment politicians to adopt or at least consider for a very long time. And now we've got somebody who was running on those platforms who got in. I honestly think that a lot of people that criticize entryism are secretly accelerationists. Basically, they want the system to go to crap so that it forces us into a revolution. But that never actually worked. There hasn't been a time where accelerationism has actually shown to be productive. And you, while you can argue the same thing about entryism to some level... That, yeah, there hasn't been a revolution due to entryism. The, the opposite is definitely not true. And in this case, at least there's opportunity to improve some people's lives. Exactly. Yes. While it is not a full-blown social and economic and legal structure type revolution, while it is not the violent fantasy that a lot of us harbor and secretly wish for, not so secretly wish for, loudly wish for in many cases... Although it is not what everyone claims to want, it is something that in the short term will do a lot of good for a lot of people. Social reform isn't how we're going to fix everything. That's a logical conclusion, but social reform is necessary in the short term so that we can survive up to the point where we can actually move dramatically toward a better solution. Exactly. And there's no guarantee that this is going to work. And the whole thing about entryism is, is that if you don't try entryism and then you try a revolution, then guess what? All your critics are just going to say, well, you didn't actually try. So we have to have this try and failure of entryism to even prove it's not going to work. Because a lot of liberals, for instance, are going to tell you it's going to work because they're going to they're going to point to like people like Roosevelt and they're going to say, hey, what about Roosevelt? Well, Roosevelt was a huge exception to the rule that we may not see happen simply because of how things are being stacked right now. Like The fact that this even happened, the fact that she won when Joseph Crowley outspent Ocasio five to one spending three million dollars on his campaign the fact that she won is hugely impressive absolutely and of course yeah part of that boils down to the community and the fact that she worked her butt off to win this race she was out there with her supporters knocking on doors telling people about her platform and everything engaging in the community doing everything that you need to do when you only have six hundred thousand dollars to work with six hundred thousand dollars that was raised by donations from said community no no big donors contributing four of that four hundred thousand of that six hundred thousand because she was helping with their agenda this is literally she is almost a pure I, characterization of what we've been asking for from our politicians I, well i really don't think that lockheed martin bear and at&t are going to fund her campaign. <laughs> well, speaking of large companies and their agendas, that is one more point in the favor of entryism for the left right now. We're all talking about how effective our direct action is being and how important our direct action is being on the, the level of uh, protests, political protests, and on, on the level of unions and strikes and, and other such demonstrations. If the higher echelons of our federal government are staffed with hashtag our guy, our direct action is going to hit much more effectively with government policy changes. Because if you have a government that is made entirely of right-wing folks of different stripes, they're potentially just going to do what Reagan did with the, uh, the airline strikes in the 1980s. 
They're not going to be sympathetic enough to respond to direct action in the way that we would ideally want them to respond. However, if there are a number of socialists or actual Democrats, not establishment donkey people, actual Democrats in public office, then when there is a large demonstration, when there is a, a strike or a protest or any other thing that generates significant media coverage and lays bare a problem that we need to address, those people in the government on the left are going to be more inclined to, at the very least, capitulate and at the very most, push new legislation that is more sympathetic to the common working man and is more conducive to realizing the goals of the proletariat. This is a huge, huge deal. People do need to, to realize you, you got to be realistic in what you're asking for. I really don't think that we could have a much better candidate there. Like this is exactly what we're, we're, we've been asking for for years and we should not complain about it. We should celebrate it. This is showing us that yes, the tides are turning and if the government and if corporations don't listen to us and if entryism isn't successful, which I don't believe it's going to be, then yes, things will eventually become violent because of course the government will eventually retaliate when the people have no choice but to take the streets. If the coals are already smoldering, all of your tinder will hit flashpoint at once. It's much more effective to let things develop on their own, to develop organically, than to push for some kind of half-baked redneck uprising in the Appalachians. I was going to say just a moment ago, uh, you said it a bit more effectively than I probably could have, but up to this point, someone like Cortez almost seemed like an unrealistic expectation from us, the people on the ground floor, asking for someone who goes door to door, who pays for their campaign push purely with donations, donations from uh, regular folk like us, someone who espouses these values, runs on that platform, and beats out an establishment politician on that platform, that seems, for a good while here, like an unrealistic expectation. But now, look at this, there's evidence that people want that, that that's not unrealistic, that's what we should be asking for, and that's what we should keep pushing for with our politicians. Exactly. And do not be surprised when the Democrats try to route out these people from the party, say that they're not real Democrats because they're already doing that. But let them do that. Let them make that mistake. Let them show there's a need for a third party. There's a need for a new movement in the country because the Democrats are shooting themselves in the foot. Of course, right after Ocasio won, Nancy Pelosi opens her freaking mouth and guess what drops out of it oh uh so must be the voters that are the problem the voters are too too left here this isn't indicative of the democratic party and what the and and what democrats want this is one district and they're just too far to the left so we have nancy pelosi saying that that crowley lost his seat because of the voters, because the voters are wrong. Let the Democratic Party continue that. Let the Democratic Party blame their own voters when their establishment starts getting replaced and see where this takes us. I mean, I'm a little bit impressed by the stamina and the ambition there, trying to dig a mass grave for her entire political party with just a silver spoon. Pelosi and Reid and all these other old guard of the Democratic Party they're probably not going to be around in 10 years. These people are 80, almost 90 years old. Pelosi can barely get out a sentence without calling President Trump Bush. So <laughs> it's ludicrous to sit there and, and say that there, there isn't a tide coming for the Democratic Party. And if, if they go in and replace all their establishment with more neoliberal types against the will of the people, there's going to be a storm coming when people go to the polls or when people decide to form a third party. And it will eventually happen. That's being generous because 
the next movement might not even be a party. It might actually be go into revolution because the two party system has failed us. I know that my personal experience isn't an explicitly uh, helpful contribution to this this conversation and I don't want to waste time, but I feel like there might be a lot of people out there who relate to this. I started getting political with the 2016 presidential run. That's what got me into this. And I identified as a Democrat for a very long time, a registered Democrat. I voted blue for the longest time. And uh, being as apolitical as I was, they're all about gay rights. So, you know, that's like, it's one political thing that I care about. I felt, while wa- watching Hillary and Sanders duke it out, I felt so profoundly betrayed by the Democratic Party. And that's, that's actually what pushed me really far left from the establishment left is seeing how poorly that, that primary was run, how, how betrayed I felt by, by the party that I had put my admittedly very small amount of political trust in for so long. I don't want to sound spiteful here, but I am happy to see the bell toll for these perfidious charlatans. Back on the subject of protests, there are mass protests in East Pittsburgh over yet another police shooting involving a black teenager. In this case, the guy was straight A student. His name's Antoine Rose. He was straight A student, all American, just salt of the earth character here. And basically this guy was just a pinnacle of of his community. He was, he was absolutely beloved. He was known by a lot of people. He did a lot of community service. In fact, when he was killed, he was coming home from a community service project with his uh, brother. What I heard from his mother at the protest was he was either coming back for community service or uh, the recreation center playing ball with his brother. Antoine was riding in a vehicle that was basically being used as an excuse the term get out uber uh it was a a jitney Uh, Jitney, i believe yes yes a jitney yes exactly he was riding around in a, a jitney which he had hired and unbeknownst to him the vehicle was used in a drive-by by a passenger that was already in the vehicle he was riding along with the driver the other passenger and him they get stopped by a cop. The cop comes out, asks some questions. They search the car. They find a, a gun in the, the glove compartment and they arrest the driver. And the passenger, of course, as well, goes uh, under questioning. The passenger actually admitted later on to to the actual crime of uh, the drive-by. So he eventually did confess. But Antoine, realizing the situation that he was in, realizing that he was a young black man being stopped by police for a drive-by in a car full of uh, other black kids from the neighborhood. He realized the situation he was in and he bolted from the car and he didn't get even 10 feet before the, the officer drew his gun and shot him three times in the back, killing him instantly. Now, this is important, I think. This is very important to note. It really goes against the narrative that we see in a lot of these cases of people of color being murdered by law enforcement personnel. You've heard it, I've heard it, we've all heard it, we hear it every single time. They would have complied if they weren't up to any perfidy. They wouldn't have run if they weren't up to any degeneracy. The attempt to avoid or disengage an encounter is effectively, in the minds of a lot of people, an admission of guilt. It, at the very least, a heavy implication. This kid was coming from wholesome activity. This kid was an overachiever in his life and not in any way engaged in any criminal or unsavory activities. And he knew this. He knew absolutely that if the cops sat him down and looked at his record and him as a person, And the things he had done that day, they would find nothing to take exception to him with. Him him knowing that, but having bolted anyway, I think that's something very important to note about the awareness of 
how dangerous it is to be just to be a person of color. So many people don't get it. They think if, oh, if you comply with the officer, well, uh, Philandro Castile, um, he complied and they shot him anyway on camera in front of his girlfriend and his three-year-old daughter. There's so many cases now. That, that just absolutely prove that that's not the reality of the situation. All these people claiming otherwise have a whole body of evidence mounted against them at this point. He had his hands up before he bolted. He put his hands up and then he, he ran. It's not like they, they could have said, even though they did try to say that it looked like he was reaching for something, the camera shows otherwise because the entire thing was posted to Facebook. Interestingly enough is it only took a few days for the officer to turn him in, uh, mostly because of the protests, because the protests were large and protesters started protesting out the guy's house. Uh, Michael Rosfeld, he's the officer that was involved. Apparently he's been disciplined for things multiple times at other stints that he had uh, when he worked at a uh, university as a police officer. He actually had a lawsuit against him and then he apparently was disciplined multiple times at a, another stint that he had as well. And then to top that off, during his training, there were questions about his professionality. If I remember correctly, the trainers had noted that he did not very effectively follow or very consistently follow escalation of force procedures and he did not do very well in any kind of de-escalation training, which is, is worrisome for anyone of any stripe, no matter how you slice it. If I remember correctly, he was... Uh, one week into no, his, he uh, was into one his, day his field training. He was one. He was he was actually four hours into his first shift after being sworn in. Good golly, Miss Molly. Exactly. He couldn't even go one day without shooting somebody, and that really it makes you wonder if maybe this wasn't premeditated. Maybe he did go in there with this idea that he was going to do something like this, especially with him having such other short terms with other police agencies and him being let go to various reasons, it stands the reason maybe there was something wrong with him and they shouldn't have hired this person. Very obviously, we see that in the field, I guess in his first four hours, I guess, I suppose, I guess, in his first four hours, he failed to properly follow escalation of force procedures. You got your foot pursuit, you got your pain compliance. In this particular incident, say something was prohibiting him from pursuing on foot and engaging physically or with pepper spray. In this case, Antoine was 10 feet from him. What is the operational range of a taser, the police issue taser? It's, uh, it's, it's five yards, it's 15 feet. They've got 15 feet of cord. They effectively engage within 15 feet. In the time that it took him to draw his gun, he could have drawn his taser. Now, the bullets hit Antoine when he was 10 feet from him, which means Antoine was a lot less than 10 feet from Rosfold when he began running, which means that inside of that distance, with Rose not presenting any kind of direct and lethal threat to Rosfold by escalation of force procedures, even if it was okay for him to have drawn his taser, he should have drawn his taser. He was within the engagement distance, he was not presenting a lethal threat. This is a textbook case of draw your taser and put the prongs in it. There's no reason for him to have drawn his gun. No reason whatsoever in this particular situation. Which goes to show, like we always point out here, that escalation of force is often not followed in these cases dealing with people of color and it puts them at risk. And this is by design. Like, this is not this allowance and this benefit of the doubt that the government and the media keeps giving to police officers is without warrant. And that's even by I'm their sure, own book. Uh, we could mention that at the protests, uh, there was another attempted vehicular homicide. We alluded to it earlier. Before, with the ICE protests, during the protests following the death of Antoine Rose, there was guess what another case of uh, attempted vehicular homicide 
So our next story here, farmers in America are killing themselves in staggering numbers, according to CBS News. This article, though preliminary, because the CDC did announce recently that they may have made a mistake in the numbers, the numbers are shocking as they, they've been published so far. But do keep in mind, even if the numbers are off by a little bit, even if it turns out that there's a slight deviance here, it's still significant. We're looking at a suicide rate of 84.5 out of 100,000 people, which is five times the national average. So there's definitely something here. And even if that number was half that, it's still two and a half, which is still very much statistically significant. Even the most conservative estimates give us a, a very dramatic difference, some kind of deviation we'd like to examine why. It's basically impossible to put your thumb on the exact reasons behind any of this, but we have some pretty on-the-nose postulations about what might be the cause. Just from the article itself, the average income of a farmer fell by 35% in 2013. So if you could imagine that over a five-year time span, your income fell by one-third, and then ask yourself if you could live off of that while at the same time inflation has gone up steady almost 2% year over year, no shock. This is going to put stress on, on farmers, farmers who already don't have the money because operating costs for a farm, guess what, happen to be really high. So one of the problems that they're facing here, they can't get health care. They don't have access to it. They can't afford it. But they also can't go onto the, uh, the, the marketplace and get health care because their income doesn't qualify them because of how income is counted in the United States. They make too much on paper, even though that money gets spent back into their business of farming. They're stuck in this cycle where healthcare is not available. And then in the cases where it may be available to them monetarily, there's not a lot of healthcare facilities out there in many of these communities. They have to drive hundreds of miles to maybe go to a dinky clinic. They may have to drive 250 miles to get to a major hospital. With that kind of distance driving, time and money are both considerable factors and whether or not they're going to be able to do that. Because a farm, if any of you have ever done outdoorsy type work or to, to, to do anything involving a great deal of physical labor, taking care of animals in particular, it involves a lot of time and a lot of effort. You can't really commit six or seven hours to driving down to the clinic and, and waiting to see somebody. The factor of money being considered here is a lot of these small farms are family owned and family run because again it requires a great deal of labor a great deal of effort coordinated effort that a family unit can put forth in keeping the business running again that ties back into insurance is family insurance plans especially in the current uh, healthcare market are exceedingly expensive and another problem with the, the cost of insurance on the current market, these small farms, they make a great deal of money on paper, but it's not a terribly profitable business because a lot of these organizations they have to contract with, these small farms, whoever they're buying their chickens from or their equipment, you know, Foster Farms, Tyson, whomever, these companies have ever-changing and very rigid standards for how you're supposed to run your business with their equipment in their product. So they'll send down auditors who will say, oh no, this needs to be overhauled or you're gonna need to rent this kind of silo or your your water system or your, your windows on this shed need to be changed. All of that has to come out of the farmer's pockets. And these companies effectively gouge these small farms so heavily and so consistently, a lot of these small family owned farms end up being profit neutral which means that all of the money, the incredible amount of money they earn selling their products, they have to put back into the business just to keep it afloat and just to make good on their contracts with these larger companies. Therefore, they can't afford good health insurance plans. They can't afford to take a couple of days off work to go down to the clinic. They can't afford the gasoline or the co-pays or what have you. They're, I guess you could say house poor, but 
farm poor? They're farm poor. Exactly. And what actually ends up happening is that these farmers, so that they can afford to operate their business, they often will take out loans from various banking institutions to continue their operations, which is actually why you hear the phrase like they're selling the farm and everything or the bank's going to take over their property. That's why they're always at threat for that. It's because they continually have to take out loans in order to maintain these franchises for these companies that they're creating products for. Fortunately, there is no problem with predatory lending in America. We just don't do predatory lending. None of our financial organizations will give you a loan specifically to collect the interest or to take your farm if you can't pay them back. I would imagine that these people have great credit scores and could no. No, they have terrible credit scores and terrible credit because of the situation that they're placed under, because they have to take out so many loans, it affects their score, etc. So it ends up that a lot of times the only people willing to lend to them are predatory institutions. You know, you often hear from the peanut gallery that is establishment politicians that small businesses are the backbone of the American economy. And I'm, I'm wondering if farmers don't factor into these people as small businesses, because if so, I mean, you know what happens when you put too much pressure on your backbone. These people are one of the prime voting blocks of the Republican Party. And here it is, the Republican Party through taking away health care, through taking away farmer subsidies, through revamping the uh, the welfare system, etc., so that these farmers can't take advantage of the system like you or I could do if we fell on hard times. They make it much harder for them. These people, they keep voting for essentially people that don't care about them, that are willing to sell them down a river. I really hope that maybe, just maybe, they'll get to the point where they actually reconsider where they realize that they're being screwed time and time again by these charlatan politicians, as you put it, and vote a different direction. Or maybe farmers unions of some sort. Maybe that's the answer for them. I really don't necessarily know, but I do know that their political solution hasn't helped them. Farmers unions, that's an entertaining thought. What happens when there's a strike at UPS or the post office? You don't get your mail. That's kind of a problem. What happens when there's a strike at Walmart? You can't go buy your 97 cent stockings or whatever. What happens when there's a strike in the food industry? People listen. Exactly, and it would be immediate. One thing that I, I really wish progressives would stop doing is I really wish that they would stop denigrating the so-called flyover states, the red states, the part of the country that they just really want to pretend doesn't fucking exist because they don't like those people. Well, guess what? You don't have a revolution in the country, political or otherwise, if you don't have the peripheral for it. These are going to be the people that ally with us. Whether or not we like that idea right now is irrelevant because sometimes you have to put aside your own little petty differences so that things can get done. No, 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 that, that liberal elitism. Exactly, the, the liberal elitism, the, the ivory tower that coasties on both the east and west coast and urbanites in the city have towards these people which supply them the food that they eat is just astounding mm -hmm. because you're not going to get these people on your side by constantly insulting them. No wonder these people pick reactionaries. And if we don't stop and if we don't start listening to them and addressing their needs and being more charitable to them and addressing their points in a manner that isn't mocking them, regardless of perceived intelligence or whatever may be. They're we're... people just like the rest of us. Exactly. They're, 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 they're people who have been lied to and gaslit for generations. And we cannot allow that petty, holier than thou, more vegan than thou, more woke than thou mindset 
permeate our current leftist movement. That is what kills solidarity, is petty squabbles within different sectors of the working class. That is what will bring down leftist or progressive schools of thought, is the inability to include people who are different superficially. I've said it before and I'll say it again, leftism is like feminism. If it's not intersectional, it's not worth shit. Excuse my language, but this is a very important concept that we all need to embrace. We cannot betray our working class brothers and sisters. We're not getting anywhere with them because we've been trying the same tactic for decades and it doesn't work. At some point, you have to extend the olive branch because what are we really going to do after the revolution? Do we really expect that we're just going to off a third of the freaking country? No, that's absurd. Only the most bloodthirsty people out there are are going to advocate that. We'll just socialize the farms right out from under the Americulacs. (laughs) <laughs> no, I'm being absolutely serious. That is actually a thought that I've seen in some <laughs> sectors of leftism. Well, you know, these rednecks, they all vote they all vote right anyway. Why not just go to their farms, shoot them, then work the farms? Why start your own commune when one is just sitting there and it's tended to by a right winger? That is the that most is... dangerous thought because they have the guns. Which <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, they've got they've got a defensible position, land that they know like the back of their hand, large families, and uh, you know, a lot of arms and ammunition, which really works with what Marx was saying. They're they're not disarmed at all, but no, like I just kind of coined that joking term right now, but I have actually seen I I've not seen them referred to as America who lacks, but I've actually seen a school or two of leftist thought where these are just the American kulaks. Well, they're not going to be part of the revolution, so shoot them and take their stuff. Well, the thing is, is they're not kulaks for the most part. Like, the call them that would be betraying the original term anyway, because unlike the kulaks, they don't actually own their land because they have given it to the bank for the most part. So... So it's the, the, historically disingenuous exactly. in a very sad way. Because exactly like you said, they they don't even own their means of production for the most part. They're leasing it out from whomever. So it's, it is a little bit disingenuous. They're employees just like us, usually for the most part. And while some of them may own the land, if they're lucky, that's not always the case. And we need to realize tactically that if there's change in this country, it's gonna have to come because these people are convinced otherwise that the politicians that they keep electing in time after time are screwing them and they're the ones responsible for their conditions, not the Democrats, not necessarily the liberals. The liberals aren't helping their case because they constantly denigrate these people. So of course it's a perfect scapegoat for these people. Because the liberals are a power suit, whereas Jeb is a pair of blue jeans. A lot of it, I think, is the aesthetic and the cultural identity. As a leftist, I'm wondering what really can be done about that, aside from educating beyond it. Aside from actually making contact with these people, being a representative of the leftist cause in a community where these these people are included, and shaking hands and learning names and actually saying we care about your plight and we want to help you there is a school of thought that realizes how grossly you are being treated and would like to do something about it and there are actionable solutions to the problems that you're having with your business that the reason that you're not getting the help that you need that your family needs and we'd like to discuss that a lot of leftists do provide a solution to these people. This isn't liberals pining for votes or anything like that. It's a social movement. It's focused on the well-being of the people at large. Speaking of solidarity uh, among workers and everything, a big, I was just going to say big, big, big loss. Absolutely a big loss. The Janus case that we've been reporting on for. A while now. I actually think that we we may have reported on it back uh, in November 
when it, it first went to trial. They lost their case. This is the first step to right to work nationwide in the United States of America. Now, say that again. I, I want everyone to hear that chilling thought once again. Just devoid of context. Say that again. The loss of the Janus case in the Supreme Court is the foot in the door for nationwide right to work. Okay, let's unpack exactly how this might preclude something that terrible. Supreme Court of the United States voted 5-4 against ASCME, which is one of the largest government unions in the country. And the case basically was whether or not you had to pay what's called an agency fee if you benefited from activity within a union. And this is different than a due because a due implies that you're a member. An agency fee does not. So what we're talking about is somebody that refuses to associate with the union, but the union activities have created a benefit. So this person should pay the union something. Now, the way agency fees work, there is a checkbox to deny the union the right to use any of that money for political donations, which is actually what this case hinged on. Because the argument that Janus was making during the case was that his requirement to pay an agency fees or dues was compelled speech. But that argument's nullified ASCME and every other union is legally required to put that checkbox on both agency fees and dues options. So even if you are a member, you can still opt out of political donations. And this is by law. So this was a direct attack on unions themselves. This had nothing to do with compelled speech because he did have the option to opt out. Now, when we were talking about this last night, I had a little bit of confusion about it, and Phelan expressed it very simply. This might be a bit of an oversimplification. He expressed it to me very simply last night, thusly. Say there's a problem with everybody in your workplace not being paid enough to make rent or put food on the table. So the workers will talk to the union, and then the union uses their toolkit, threats of strikes, all the other things that a union can use. They use their toolkit of strategies to apply pressure on the boss to make a change. You're not a member of the union. You're just one of the workers. So the union applies pressure and the boss says, okay, that's cool. I'll just pay your union boys 30% more. And the union goes, that's great. But then the boss goes, but I can't do that because that would be unfair. So then the boss has to pay everybody another 30%. That includes you the non-union member. So you're benefiting from the actions of an organization that you're not a part of. That's part one. You should pay your fair share when you reap these benefits. And part two is the operating costs. That union expended time and manpower and money in order to apply that pressure on your boss for your benefit, if not necessarily on your behalf. And as a result of that, they're going to need more money. And union dues might not necessarily cover that. Because if a certain percentage of your workplace isn't union, then they're not going to have enough money in dues to cover the costs of whatever action they decided to undertake in order to apply that pressure on your boss. Therefore, one, you're paying your fair share. And two, you are contributing to their ability to help you out as a side effect of helping out their membership. The idea is, is that if you benefit from the union, you should contribute something towards it because not doing so risks the existence of the union. There are already right-wing think tanks right now that are putting up websites telling people to disengage with their unions right now in states that are not right to work, like Oregon, for instance, where I'm at. There's already websites up for those states informing people 
that they can drop out of union dues or they can drop out of the agency fees and not have to pay them and the unions aren't going to steal their their paychecks and spend it all on the democrats which in and of itself as we said is already a lie it's a conflation because you can opt out of those particular distributions and the other thing is is the agency fees so if you're you're not a member and you still have to pay something those are typically much smaller because they're just going towards the operations and fun core functions of the union. You're not paying to get the relief fund or to get uh, direct representation. So your pay is much, much smaller. There, there really is no reason to complain. It is a direct attack. Well, yeah, exactly. Working in a union shop is like having cable television. If you don't want to be part of the union, all you do is you pay for the basic two or three channels. But if you actually want the union benefits, then you shell out more money per month for your stars or your HBO or whatever. Okay, so to clarify, that's actually not the case in Oregon. So in Oregon, if your shop unionizes, you do have to join the union. So you do, you don't have a choice there, but, right, but you you have the option of not paying the portion of, of the dues that cover political donation. Now, in a right to work state, that's actually what they mean by you can choose your, your level here. This is where the agency fees come in. So in, in right to work states, a lot of unions have agency fees, which prevent the whole right to work scenario from occurring. So what they did was is they stepped around it and then they made something that was even tighter than right to work. In most cases, in states that are not right to work, if your shop votes to unionize, you're part of the union and have to pay dues unless it's agreed upon otherwise. Which is where the rather disingenuous term right to work comes from, is if you don't want to be associated with a union, you need to find a job at a place that isn't a union shop, which sounds bad, but really isn't in terms of the benefits that unions offer having a union is better than not having one it's, it's like insurance for instance so if you have insurance and you don't need it you're better off than if you don't have insurance and need it there's all sorts of other things that unions provide like relief funds for instance like if you're in a big corporate union even though i don't necessarily like to say go big corporate but if that's what you vote on that's an option that you can have so if you lose your job you could get basically what's what's known as severance pay without the company being involved there's all sorts of different benefits to being in there. The other thing is, is that strikes are not the only weapon that they have in their arsenal. A lot of times with, when negotiations are being held, the workers go to the bosses in the, in the meetings, in the negotiation meetings. They say, hey, you know what? Uh, we, we want more pay, but you have this, that, and this other problem that really needs to get solved. And it's really messing with our productivity. It's a way of airing grievances that could actually benefit the business and make it more profitable. So there is actually a beneficial reason for unions to exist outside of even workers' interests that businesses themselves could actually utilize. The idea that unions are a, are a hopefully bad thing is just absolute propaganda. Well, yeah, and as Sam Walton wrote in his uh, his <laughs> autobiography, his uh, his Walmart How I Done It book, it is conducive to the interests of the higher echelons of management to listen to the the people on the ground floor, the people on the lowest level, because they're going to be communicating with one another, and they're going to be in contact with most of the problems that your company will experience. So a union is a way of, this is a weird line of logic to follow, a union is a way of putting into action Sam Walton's own logic of letting the workers who are actually tending to the shop floor speak among one another and then bring a problem to you that you might not be aware of or bring an actionable solution to a problem to you that you might not have come up with yourself if you're a business owner. 
I think Sam Walton would be rolling in his grave with that interpretation, but it is pretty spot on and a very interesting observation and I absolutely love it. Just a slightly optimistic thing, like I would like to point out how important direct action has been and while we do have a lot of negativity that we're looking at right now, the protests and the direct action of tech employees deciding not to be part of the problem is something that should be reinforced. Exactly. And as a positive follow up to a story that we covered last week, the UPS workers, they won. They won their strike. They actually they didn't even strike. They just won. They went to the negotiation table. They said, well, you could take it or leave it. And they got 150% pay raise for uh, part-time workers and like 170 almost percent pay raise uh, for full-time workers over the course of uh, what? I believe it was four years. The, the drivers are currently making 19 an hour and by... And by 2022, they want it to be 35-ish dollars. And the box handlers working in the warehouse, the warehouse staff, they're currently making, I think, 950 something an hour. And they want to push that to uh, 1530 something in four years. Now, the immediate results are going from 930 something to 1050 something in the next year for the the warehouse employees and for the drivers. It's going from 19 even to, I think, 2150 something in the next year. So that's a pretty heavy raise pretty immediately. There was one thing that concerned me is I didn't hear anything about the hours, hours they're yes. working. But you mentioned that they were talking about doing a jump on hiring, which means more hands on deck. Right. More workers, probably going to be fewer hours all around, which they need it in this full-time positions when they're working 70 almost 80 hours per week especially when they should be able to tap out at 60 and they're not being allowed to it's pretty apparent that like you said direct action gets the goods and, and i know that we harp on this every week but looking to build a union looking to join a union it works if we had more union and labor power in this country, we wouldn't be in the position that we are today where so many people are just basically begging for scraps. And the thing is, that labor power translates directly to political power. Because as you can tell anyone who's apolitical, politics affects literally every walk of your life. So if you get active in your workplace and demand your rights there, and win them by unifying and showing solidarity with your coworkers and other people in your industry, it is a very small step to start doing that politically. And we see the, the direct action of the ICE offices being blocked by, by protesters. We see the, the direct action of a dialogue on race and law enforcement having been generated in our country. And we see the direct action of these people in these tech companies refusing to be complicit in the goals of what could very well turn into a totalitarian cyber state. We're seeing direct action and working class solidarity and political leftist solidarity across the board. We're seeing it have dramatic effects on our situation. People just need to realize they need to go out and they need to get active. They need to do something and things will happen. Things will move. And maybe it's not always in a positive direction. Sometimes you don't always gain ground. That's okay. But if you lose hope, if you don't do anything, then nothing's going to happen. And it will be the slow march into cybernetic authoritarianism. And we can't afford to allow that to happen. So we need to keep our chin up. We need to stay in the fight. And to any of you listening out there who are involved in a union or involved in a protest group or involved in Antifa or who are out there distributing documents trying to foster class consciousness, to any of you out there who are engaging in direct action, bless you and thank you. You are the solution that our civilization needs. Also, thank you for listening to our show tonight. We very much appreciate every listener. We got a lot of great responses to last week's show. I really did appreciate a lot of the things that uh, comments that were left on various social media, particularly Google Plus. You guys know who you are and you're awesome. Thank you. If you do enjoy our stuff, like, comment, subscribe. Check our Twitter at, at Enceladus1. Uh, we'll be seeing you guys very soon with some bonus content. Well, thank you. Good night and good luck.
And if you really dig our content, if if you if you really dig the the show and our attempt to try and get not heard of news out there, help it be more heard of. Distribute it. Distribute it like the riches of beheaded kings. <laughs>